Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Mitch, for coming down from Detroit. Thanks, for yeah, thanks for having me here. The, um, <clears throat> you know, I, I uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the first thing of yours that I read was Tuesdays with Maury, and I just remember weeping uncontrollably. And then many Thank years you. ago, you, <laughs> you may not remember this, but <clears throat> many years ago, you gave a talk at a conference, I think it was in Sacramento, of a bunch of contractors. So basically big burly guys in their like 40s and, and middle-aged burly guys from the Midwest. And it was the morning, it was like 9 a.m., 8.30 a.m. I was at the conference and I decided to go and see you because I thought, oh, I remember this guy, you know, I cried my way through to his more, it'd be interesting to go. So I go there and so it's like a thousand of these big burly contractors, 9 a.m. in Sacramento. And about 20 minutes in, everyone's crying. <laughs> and like, now getting someone, getting big burly white guys to cry at nine in the morning is really hard. <laughs> <laughs> so then I read a little liar yesterday. And I'm just weeping. <laughs> So my question to you is, first of all, what's with it with you in tears? <laughs> and more importantly, for years I've been fascinated by who, which living person has got more people to cry than anyone else? <laughs> and I, for the longest time I thought it was Richard Curtis, you know, who wrote Four yeah. Weddings and a Funeral. Yeah. It's not. It's Mitch Album. Uh, <laughs> what an honor. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, I don't remember the, the uh, Sacramento uh, gig. It was, but, un uh, by the way, un I was in the back. And like, everyone, none of us, you know, you're not supposed to cry if you're a big burly white guy. Right, right. And so everyone was trying to pretend that they weren't crying, but they were just weeping. The whole audience was like this. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought they were sleeping, I guess. <laughs> um, well, it's not my intent. I mean, uh, you know, I don't set out to try to make people cry. But I guess I end up writing about subjects that are, that, uh, you know, touch people's hearts. And there are times, honestly, when I write, um, when I tear up myself. Yeah. You know, and I consider that a good thing. You know, I feel like, well, if you can't make yourself at least tear up, if not fully cry, then how are you going to expect to do it for anybody else? And, you know, a lot of my books are tied, especially my novels, are thinly veiled characters of people from my life. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes when the characters pass in the book, it really was when they passed in my life. And sometimes, like Tuesdays with Maury or Finding Chica, they're real stories. And, you know, and then I do cry. You know, I cried all the way through uh, Finding Chica, so, uh, which is about a little girl that we adopted from Haiti who passed away. And so, um, yeah, but I really don't set out to make people, big yeah. burly or otherwise, <laughs> try to cry. But you are, you're very comfortable with strong emotions. Yeah. Do you know where that comes from? Uh, yeah. Um, I think when I wrote Tuesdays with Maury, which was a real pivot in my life, mm -hmm. up to that point I was a sports writer and only a sports writer. I mean, I wrote, I was on ESPN, I did sports radio, but everything was sports, sports, sports. And I always say people used to see me in airports because, you know, they watch ESPN and they would say, hey, sports guy, yeah, you know, who's, they didn't bother, you know, Lupica, hey, Lupica, you know, I'm not, I wasn't Lupica, but it didn't matter, we were all the same, you know, <laughs> and uh, I always wonder if Lupica ever got, hey, album, you know, because yeah. he would never tell me if he did, but, uh, and so uh, they would say, hey, sports guy, you know, who's going to win the Super Bowl, and I would say, you know, Patriots, and go up the escalator, and then um, after I wrote Tuesdays with Maury, which was just supposed to be a momentary stop in my sports writing career. You know, I wrote it to pay Maury's medical bills. I've told this story many times. It was supposed to be a tiny little book. They printed 20,000 total copies for the world. That was all they were gonna, I thought I'd have them in the trunk of my car the rest of my life. And um, when it started to become this thing, people would stop me in airports and they would say, my mother died of cancer and the last thing we did was read your book together can I talk to you? Mm -hmm. And you can't say, Patriots, and <laughs> go up the escalator. Yeah. So I began to you know, become, as Amy Tan, 
who's a friend of mine, predicted. I had sent her Tuesdays with Maury before anybody had ever read it. And I said, you're the only person I know who writes books like this, because everybody else I knew was in sports. I said, is this any good? And she read it, she wrote me back, and she said, I'm gonna tell you two things. One, it's very good, you're gonna be surprised how many people are gonna read it. And two, you're about to become everybody's rabbi. <laughs> and that's what happened. And so the answer to your question is, I have been exposed, as close as I am to you or closer, mm -hmm tens of thousands of times to the rawest of emotions, grief. I remember a guy once came up to me in a book sign of Tuesdays with Maury and grabbed my arm and started crying and he wouldn't let go of my arm. And, um, and like this was security and all this stuff and I said, it's okay, he's obviously upset and he finally when he broke through his tears he said, um, my, my wife just died yesterday and we were reading your book and I just wanna touch you it just makes me feel closer. I'm sorry, I'll let go. I'll let go now, you know. Mm -hmm. And that has made me sensitive to those emotions. And it's not an, and not an accident that I've never written another sports book since then because this is my world. This is what I hear. This is what I talk to people about all the time. Those burly men, you know, mm -hmm. that's probably at the end of that talk, many of them came up to me and said, you know, my mother died, my wife died. And so I've, I've become used to it and, and you know to me if you're going to go through the whole effort of writing a book and it's hard work I think you should move people in some way mm -hmm. you know it shouldn't just be that was a cool story okay move on you know at least I for me I want to try to move people yeah yeah Th this, <clears throat> this is interesting I, this, I wanted to follow up on this this transition that you made but you've made a number of transitions <clears throat> in your career in fact yeah. your career I mean this in the best w possible way, is super weird. <laughs> you, yeah. you start out and you think you're going to be a musician. Right. Is this true? This is absolutely true. We're going to talk about music in a second, but yeah. you know what's coming. Yeah, I know. Then, that, does, what happens to that? That died right here in New York City. <laughs> uh, I had a gig uh, before. when I, I only wanted to be a musician all through high school. All through, I didn't want to go to college. My parents said, you have to go to college. Then, you know, it's the old, you have to have something to fall back on kind of thing. And uh, it was funny because I was a musician and, and all those years I went to college, to have, but I studied music and sociology, which wasn't going anywhere. And then my father, who always wanted me to be a lawyer, I was a musician, musician. And after a number of years, when I stopped being a musician, I said to my father, you know, I think I'm, I think I'm going to stop being a musician. Um, and he was, you could see, he was fighting this smile on his face. <laughs> and he was like, well, you gave it a great shot, you know, and, you know, it's, you know, it's what happens sometimes, Mitch. You know, what, what are you thinking of going to? And I said, writing. And he goes, writing? <laughs> That's the fire to the frying pan. <laughs> That's the first time I ever heard that expression. And that was... Uh, but that career died here in New York City. I had, been a, uh, I had been a nightclub singer and piano player on the island of Crete, which we'll come back to in the Greek stuff, but that's, I lived in Greece. And I had the greatest job in the world. I, I, played, I played like an hour of, of a lounge piano, and then I went in and sang with the band, uh -huh. and they never had anybody sing American rock and roll. I was like, and I think some of them, th I was singing Elvis songs, but I think they thought they were original, you yeah. know? Yeah. And I would dance around the room and sing these Elvis songs and everything. And, and that was all I had to do, like an hour and then a half an hour, and I was done. And they gave me a bungalow uh, on the Aegean Sea, and they gave me $350 cash every week. And, and, and like an idiot, I came back from that job, you know? Because <laughs> I had to come. Th you would still be there. Oh, I, I should have stayed there. <laughs> and uh, I went back. Uh, Two years ago, I went back to that place. For my first time in 43 years, I went back to the place where I sang. And it was, it was in this fishing village then called Agios Nicolaos, which then was a very sleepy little fishing village and now is like, looks like Miami Beach. But I found the hotel and I found, they still had the piano that I played at and everything. And, and uh, I said to them, could I come back here like next summer and get my old job back just for a summer, <laughs> write a book about what it's like to do yeah. the same thing at the beginning of your career and the end of your career? And they said, how much will you charge? And I said, <laughs> I said I'll work for free. They said, you can come anytime. You know? <laughs> so um, so I, I may still do that. 
Um, so then I came back here and I, I tried the whole starving musician thing and right. I, I played in all the clubs around here on Monday nights, you know, yeah. and, and the only night you could get, you had to bring your friends with you. And, and um, eventually uh, my music career died here thanks to the insensitivity of, of, of New York record executives. <laughs> And, uh, and, and I got into writing completely by accident. I was uh, living out in Queens and uh, went to a supermarket one day while I was as a musician. And there was a newspaper that they threw in your basket called the Queens Tribune. And it had a little ad on the front that said, if you have spare time, we could use help with our newspaper. And uh, I went down there because I was working at night. I had time during the day. And they, I was like the youngest person there by 25 years. And they gave me an assignment that night to write about parking meters, a story about parking meters. They were having a meeting about it or something. And I'd never written anything. But I read a lot of newspapers. And I know the first paragraph is mm -hmm. kind of the nut paragraph, the second paragraph, the quote, third paragraph, you spread it out. And I just sort of mimicked that, you know. Uh, of course, I went with like a pad and like Woodward and Bernstein, because that's all, that's all I knew was all the president's men. What do you mean those parking meters are going up in <laughs> And, and, and I wrote the story, and the next week I went back to the supermarket, and I picked up the paper, and my story was on the bottom of the front page with my name on it. And you know this, Malcolm. You get that, you see your name, and you get this little tingle, you know, like, yeah. that's me. And I was a writer. And then sports happens. You become a sports writer. Are you a big sports fan this entire no. time? No. <laughs> Not really. Not really. I mean, you know, I, I, I am now, obviously, I spent the last 30 something years in it, but I, uh, if you want the funny story, the, the truth is, uh, I was, went back to Columbia and to try to pay my bills, I worked at night as a piano player in a little bar that's on 72nd, it's closed now, and I would play for the drunks until two o'clock in the morning, and I get $25 a night if, if, if I bought in customers. And I used that money towards my tuition, and I needed more money, and I got a job at Sport Magazine part-time um, uh, because that's what was up on the job board, you know, mm. in Columbia. I, if it was Sewing Magazine, I'd have been a sewing writer or something. <laughs> and, and so when I graduated, all of my clips were sports clips, and you know this bit, yeah. you know. So you send out your clips to try to get your next job. Well, there was a Sunday Magazine job, ed advertising editor and publisher magazine. And it just said Sunday Magazine writer for Southeastern Daily, you know, and that's what I wanted. I wanted to be Tom Wolfe, you know, I wanted to write the, the new journalism, the big Sunday Magazine think piece, that kind of thing. So I sent off my clips, which were mostly sports clips, and I don't hear anything back. I go to Finland for the track and field world championships uh -huh. for track and field news. And, uh, I was I'm, a subscriber to Track and Field News at this exact time. You realize this? You were? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. You must have read my piece. I, I, think, I, I think I did. Yes. Uh, yeah. I think I did. Which year is this? This is 19, uh, 1982, 83, right around there. I'm trying to think who would have won the 1,500 meters, but go on. Uh, well, we had a guy, uh, Scott, uh, his last name was Scott, I think, and he oh, ran Steve the Oh, Steve Scott. Steve Scott, yeah. Of course. I hung out with Steve Scott. You hung out with Steve oh, Scott? Oh, my gosh, yeah. I knew what he ate for breakfast and everything. He was yeah. my idol. Yeah, Steve was Scott so was good, and he got boxed in on the, on the, uh, on the race there, and he, got, he lost. Yeah. We were going to go off on a track <laughs> and field tangent. So I'm in Finland for the track and field news in a tiny little hotel room. My phone rings. I pick it up, I hear the you know, from the America, the United States. Is this Mitch Album? I said, yeah. This is Fred Turner. I'm the sports editor of the Fort Lauderdale News and Sun Sentinel. He's from Boston. I said, uh, yeah. He says, you know that Sunday magazine writer job you applied for? I said, yeah. You didn't get it. <laughs> I said, okay. You call me all the way over here in Finland to tell me I didn't get a job? And he said, well, uh, the guy who was uh, looking at that, he saw that he had a lot of sports clips and he thought they were pretty good, so he brought them over to me and I've been reading them and they ain't bad, so if you want a job in sports, I got a job in sports for you. And I came back to America, I flew down there, I took a job in sports, I was in sports ever since. And that's how I ended up in sports. Oh, God. So I always wonder, like, if that guy didn't walk my clips over yeah. to his table, what would I have been, you know? I'd be following Steve Scott around. <laughs> following Steve Scott around. Yeah. Wait, um, we should probably do this before we get too far afield. On the music thing, if you've been talking so much, you, you will note that behind you, yeah. there is a Korg. 
Yeah. And um, <clears throat> we have a request that you play uh, one of your most famous compositions, What's which that? you know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about Cooking for Two from oh. the legendary <laughs> Arnold Schwarzenegger 1992 made for TV movie Christmas in Connecticut. Yeah. Can you can see you? the recognition in the crowd? <laughs> yes, do that one. <laughs> no, no. Mitch, Mitch, no, no, this, for some reason, I have no idea, my, uh, my colleague Ben is obsessed with this and really wanted us to do this. And I thought, how great would it be for you to sing one of our songs? Just like, just, just give us a little taste. Well, I have to tell you the story yeah, of the tell song. Yeah, tell the story. Tell the story. Okay. It involves your roommate. Yeah. It involves my wife also, uh, who was also my roommate, <laughs> but in a different way. So uh, after I got out of the music business, I had a college roommate who went into the movie business. And he knew that I was a musician. And he was making a movie with Arnold Schwarzenegger. He was a producer. And Schwarzenegger yeah. was the director of Christmas in Connecticut, the remake. <laughs> Sounds about as good as it was, I think. And, uh, and they needed it. It's, it's, it's a song because she played Diane uh, Cannon, played yeah. the uh, lead, and she was a, a cook on TV or whatever. Yeah. So the song had to be about food. And they wanted to use um, Harry Connick's recipe for love or something like yeah. that, but they couldn't afford it. Yeah. <laughs> so Stan calls me and says, we need a song that's kind of upbeat about food uh, for Arnold Schwarzenegger's movie. Can you do it? You know, I said, well, when do you need it by? Thursday, you know. <laughs> it was Tuesday, you know. So I just went and wrote a little song. And my wife is a singer, a fantastic singer. And uh, I said, honey, can you sing this song because we don't have time to go find anybody else? And um, I wrote it. She sang it. We made this tape. Her brother, uh, Johnny, did the orchestrations of a, it was like a big band kind of song. And um, apparently they played it for Schwarzenegger and it was like this song or there was another one from some other source. And he listened to it and he said, I like the one with the girl. <laughs> And that's how the song was chosen. Yeah, yeah. I like the one with the girl, you know. And so um, the song ended up as the closing song uh, for the movie. Yeah. So it's the my climate. wife sings it. Yeah. So now you want me to play it. I want you to play it. I really think you should. Yeah. Right. Let's go, let's go. <laughs> First, I have, I have to remember it. I gave you a warning. Don't don't play yeah, this game with I us. I gotta remember. <laughs> yeah, you gave me a warning about a day ago. Right. So it went. Uh, now remember, it had to be about music. It had to be about food. Food. So it went. Uh, Kitchen, I got something fixing, appetizing and new. Here's a clue. We're cooking for two. They're inside the oven, something warm and loving. Friends wouldn't laugh if they knew that it's true. We're cooking for two. Here's the uh, core of the bridge. I was a soup for one girl, leftovers every night. Oh, but once I tasted your kisses, I was dining by candlelight. Here's a recipe for all the world to see. We take some me and some you, let it stew. We're cooking for two, I love you. Ba, 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 ba. We're cooking for two, ba, 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 ba. <laughs> ranks amongst one of the most embarrassing things I've ever done. <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, I can't tell you. That's when I, now I think, should, I, should we just turn this into a little impromptu concert? A hoot nanny? Yeah. What should we? <laughs> if you want to play any other song at any point, Mitch, just let me know. Okay. Um, Depends on how the rest of this goes. Yeah. How the rest. <laughs> but, um, all right, we're going to get, but now we have to change tone. We're going to get a little more serious. Okay. And I want to talk about your latest book a little bit, um, called The Little Liar. Um, and, bef but as a kind of prep, as a kind of, for those who don't know, 
Uh, I'm gonna, it's, a, it's a book that takes place during the Holocaust. And I want you to start by talking about your, 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 your grounding in Jewish culture. What, is, what, is, what does being Jewish mean to you? Because you, you can't read that book and not think there is something, you're speaking about things that are very near and dear to you. And I wanted you to kind of. Yeah. Well, I've had a lot of um, various deep uh, exposures to Judaism mixed in with some very distant kind of wanderings away. So I was raised in a neighborhood where a number of Jewish people lived there, including some Holocaust survivors. Mm. And I would always notice when I was a kid, um, they would wear long sleeves wherever they went. And I remember asking my mother about that. Why are they wearing long sleeves? And she said, well, they have no numbers tattooed on their arms and they don't want people to see. Well, why don't they want people to see? Well, I'll tell you when you're older, you know. And of course I got older and I found out. Um, I went to public school. And then this is where in, in New Jersey, New South Jersey. Jersey, just outside of Philadelphia, mm -hmm. I went to public school. And then um, I was kind of, <clears throat> we didn't have a great public school system and I was getting a little lost in the shuffle. They would stick me over in the corner and give me a little box of like, I don't know, some kind of projects that you have to work on by yourself. You know, I was kind of completely separated from the rest of the class. because I guess I was doing work that was a little further ahead. And my parents didn't like that, and they said, you know, we got to find a better school. And, and they found this Jewish uh, day school 40 miles away. And uh, that's where they sent me from the time I was in sixth grade until 11th grade. And I would have to get up at f before 5 o'clock in the morning uh, to go there. My father would drop me off in the, in, there at, at, at 6 o'clock or 6.30 in the morning. And we, a janitor would open the door and let me come inside because my dad had to get to work. And I would sit there for like an hour and a half until school opened next door. And interestingly, the janitor said, you know, I'm not gonna let you walk around this building and dirty this building. So you gotta stay in that one room right there, front room. And what was the room? The music room. And it had a piano in it. And that's how I learned how to play piano. Because yeah. every day I had an hour and a half of to nothing to do, no kids, no anything. And so I sat and, because I taught myself, I don't, I never took lessons. I just had a, you know, noodle around. And so um, then I had a Jewish education where half the day was in Hebrew, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, then I got out and kind of wandered away from it. And years later, I kind of came back when I wrote a book with a rabbi uh, who was dying, uh, who wanted me to do his eulogy. And it was called Have a Little Faith. It was a book about a pastor and a rabbi. I married a, a, a very Christian woman who's devout, and I run a Christian orphanage in Haiti. Um, so I kind of moved between the worlds. But the answer to your question about, you know, what does it mean to be Jewish? I think first and foremost, um, at least in my perspective, it means a history. You know, and, and you, can't just, you can't just be Jewish like, that's my religion and that's it. The history is a huge part of it. And Holocaust is part of that history. And so there was a part of me that felt that once I was blessed with to have the kind of success that I have been able to have, there was something in the back of my mind that always said, before you die, you need to write some book that talks about the Holocaust and doesn't let it be forgotten. Whatever little inch you can move it forward mm -hmm. and just say, you know, tell a story that maybe people will talk about and say, you know, Oh, I remember that story. So therefore, by remembering that story, I won't forget the Holocaust. You need to do it. And um, I was in Yad Vashem, which is the uh, Holocaust Museum in Israel, uh, 10 years ago for a book tour. And I uh, was wandering around. And I, they have these videos playing all the time of different survivors telling stories. And I stood in one, front of one of them. And it was a woman telling a story about, she said, everybody always asks us, why did you get on those trains if you knew that they were taking you to your death? You know, as if they did something wrong, you know. And she said, and I said to them, we didn't know because when we got to the train platforms, the Nazis had Jewish people standing there telling us that it was okay to get on the trains. These people were held at gunpoint or they had their families or whatever, they were threatened. Uh, so we believed them. And I just remember like being gobsmacked when I heard that, like, oh my God, of all the things, you know, that you trick your own people into lying to your own people 
to go to your death. And I sat with that idea for a long time and said, if I'm gonna, when, I, when and if I can do this Holocaust book, I wanna, I wanna use that somehow. Mm -hmm. But I could never formulate it into a story until one day I said, what if it's not a grown person who knows what they're doing? What if it's a kid who's never told a lie before and that becomes the first lie that he ever tells? The first lie that he ever tells is the worst lie that he's ever gonna tell. And that's when I got kind of hooked into the idea of, of uh, The Little Liar. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, so you carried, so you've had this idea that you wanted, you've always wanted to do a Holocaust book and you've carried that notion around in your head for a decade. Yeah. And what, how, how soon after you, when you come to the realization that, you, that the way to tell the story is through the eyes of the kid, how quickly does the book appear after that? Uh, a couple years. I did yeah. one book, one book in between, uh, Stranger in the Lifeboat, um, before I did this one. But I already had this one in mind. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay. And you know, you think about your next book even while you're working on mm -hmm. the current one. And yeah, so a couple of years, but it took me, it took me seven or eight years to kind of noodle it around to come up with, no, let's do it from the point of view of a child. And then, and then I came up with the idea to tell it from the point of view of the truth, that the narrator of the book would not be the boy and would not be a third person, it would be the truth. The truth would actually narrate the book. And once I, I wrote a couple paragraphs that were like, uh, you can trust the story you're about to hear, you can trust it because I'm the only thing in this world you can trust. I'm the mirror that holds your final reflection. I'm the shadow you can't outrun. I am truth. And this is a story about a boy who tried to break me. And when I wrote that and I read it, I said, I would turn the page on that book. You know, yeah. I'd want to see what came next. And that's when I said, okay, I got a book. And then I had to ask my editor if it was okay. She's here somewhere. And uh, she said, thankfully, she said, yeah, sounds good. And we went on. The book, without realizing, when, when, when did the book come out? In November? November, November yeah. So you write this book, and then it, is, it has inevitably been read through the lens of October 7th. Yeah. Tell me about how, that, how the fact of October 7th has changed the way people are perceiving the book, or even how you perceive what you've written. Well, two different answers to two different questions you asked me. The way other people perceive it, um, I think, you know, the, the people come up and say, oh, it's such a timely book. Thank you for writing such a timely book. I'm like, I started it like 10 years ago. <laughs> it's not like I had any idea. Um, and there are a lot of uh, elements of it that are resonant. I thought it would be a timely book because it was about the truth. I didn't think it would be a timely book because of anti-Semitism or things like that. I thought, you know, well, we live in an era where truth is such a subjective thing all of a sudden. And, you know, the phrase my truth is becoming, you know, a very common phrase. And, and, and people can kind of, you know, pick their truth and just watch their own TV news network, or whatever, and not watch the other ones and kind of get a certain view of the world and believe certain things are true. And other people can do the exact opposite. So I thought it was going to be timely because of that. And then we have this other element. As far as like for me personally, I think the thing that hit me the most, Malcolm, was um, the week it came out, uh, Anderson Cooper, who's a friend of mine, has come with me to Haiti and everything. Uh, we were somewhere here in New York and he said, and he had just gotten back from Israel from reporting because October 7th, November was the book. And he said, I read your book. He said do you know the story about this Israeli kid named Tomer? I said, no. He said, you haven't heard this? Somebody hasn't brought this up to you? I said, no. He said there was a kid named Tomer who was 16 years old and lived in uh, one of the kibbutzes or whatever right on, that got attacked on October 7th. And when Hamas came over, they grabbed him and they, at, at, under the threat of killing his family, they said, you have to go door to door to every house here and knock on the door in a calm voice and tell them it's safe to come out. They're gone. And he did this, trying to save his family. And when the people came out, Hamas shot them. And then when they were done with their little liar, they killed him too. And uh, that's when I realized like, oh my gosh, mm -hmm. the evil that you think of in your head in an imaginary form can't compare to what we do as human beings on this earth, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's when it hit me like, 
on a personal level. When I read the book, I understood that it was written with this theme of truth and lies, but what I thought it was about was memory. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's a kind of post October 7th reading of it, because to me, that's a book about, I mean, uh, we don't want to give away the plot, but this book is about a group of people who all, all have a, all go through their own Holocaust experience and are carrying that experience with them over the balance of their lives, yeah. right? It's how they're dealing with these memories. And the reason I read it that way, because the thing that struck me about, <clears throat> or the thing that, and I may be wrong, but the thing that it had, it struck me most about this kind of wave of anti-Semitism we're seeing is that it's a kind of, it's not real anti-Semitism in the, fa in the sense that it feels like it's fashionable anti-Semitism. And a lot of the kids saying these kinds of things strike me as people who actually don't know what they're talking about. Which is the most dangerous kind. Which is the most dangerous kind. But these are people who haven't had their memories, they have no memories, they haven't been instructed in what to know and remember about the event. They're acting out of, and so the book, the reason I thought, the, I think of the book as being so important is that it's about, you've got to keep telling, you can't ever stop telling stories. That's, That's the right. thing. And I feel like the easiest thing in the world is to think, oh, I've told the story now. I have, and I can go no, on. I'm done and with it, yeah. We're done. Well, that's a very astute analysis of it. And the book does follow this little boy who gets tricked by the Nazis, who's this boy who's never told a lie, gets tricked by the Nazis into standing on the train tracks and telling people everything's good, you're going to new homes, you're going to new, new jobs. And he does this for several weeks until the last train, he sees his own family being put on the train and he finds out that the trains are actually going to Auschwitz. And the Nazi who tricked him doesn't let him go. And, um, and so he sees his family and his loved ones and everybody taken away and he can't go with them. And from that point forward, and this is what I really wanted to write, I wanted to write what were the effects of that. Yeah. Not just for a year and not just till 1945, which is a lot of books that deal with the Holocaust. I'm not knocking them, they're great, you know, but a lot of them begin on Kristallnacht and end with the Liberation Day and that's it, you know, it's all, and everything takes place at the concentration camp. I wanted to show the effects of the Holocaust and lying for years. And it really follows four people, the little boy, Nico, the little girl who loved him, Fanny, his older brother, Sebastian, who gets sent to the concentration camps, and the Nazi who tricked him for the next 40 years just following the memory mm -hmm. or the ramification of that one lie and how it changed all of them for the rest of their lives. And, um, and that is the impact of a terrible lie. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't just go away. And you know, uh, if you ask yourself, what's the worst lie I ever told? And what were the, and you think, you know, what were the, who got damaged? You know, maybe a marriage was lost. Maybe a relationship was broken. Maybe a business ended. Maybe, you know, so, I mean, terrible things and what would you do to be forgiven for that lie and that's Nico spends his whole life trying to be forgiven Fanny spends her whole life trying to forgive him Sebastian spends his whole life not forgiving him you know and the, and the Nazi spends his whole life you know trying to you know justify what he did mm -hmm. and uh, that to me was what made it interesting because it spans all those years it's funny because I've been writing this book this uh, sequel to the tipping point and I have uh, a chapter on the Holocaust, a very different side of the story. But I'm following a group of survivors who all end up in Los Angeles after the war and are, they all meet because they um, are taking English classes at Hollywood High in the 50s. Hmm. And they're this extraordinary group of people and they're, you know, one ends up being a billionaire and one ends up, I mean, they just have these incredible lives. But the central struggle of their life, because they, they all have oral histories, you can find them, and the central struggle of their life is what to do with their memories. So they, what do you, what do you tell your child, right? How do you explain you don't have any cousins? You, do you want, you're now in America, you're starting over again. Some part of you wants to say, let's just erase it and hit reset. So they go talk about it for years and years. And then they sort of realize there's one incredible, I quote this one woman, uh, 
who wouldn't even talk to her own child about it. Yeah. And she gets a call from the Simon Wiesenthal Center one night, this is like 1960, someone has defaced the Jewish cemetery in Encino or somewhere in the valley. And she says, why are you calling me? And then the guy starts talking and the, she says she goes home that night and she dreams. It all comes back to her in a dream. Mm. And then the next day she says, okay, I'll talk about it. I'll that. tell everybody, yeah. Right? I mean, it's just like yeah. those kind of, but it's the same. It's so funny because I'd just been through this, but the theme of that kind of story is picked up in your, because that's, that's 20 years after yeah. the event. Well, it's and funny because a lot of those things, as you know, you read the book, kind of happen in this mm. book too. Nico, who becomes a, he becomes a pathological liar because he can't speak the truth anymore. And he starts changing his name, changing his identities, forging things. He ends up in California. And of course, if you can become a brazen liar in America, you'll become immensely successful. Yeah. And he, he becomes a millionaire, you know, in, in, in Los Angeles, in the film industry, you know. Um, and and uh, Fanny, the girl, marries Sebastian, the brother, and they have a child and they fight about exactly what you said. You know, he becomes a Nazi hunter trying to track down his brother so that he can bring him to justice. And the, his wife, Fanny, says, why do you live in the past? Why, mm -hmm. why won't you let this go? And yeah. he says, how can you let it go? You've got to tell our daughter why she doesn't have any cousins, you know, why she doesn't have any grandparents, why she doesn't. And I have met people across the spectrum on this, people who have kept the, kept the horrors to themselves and people who have gone exactly the opposite. This is a wonderful woman. She passed away not too long ago, but she was a Holocaust survivor and talked about it all the time and came up in conversation. And I remember she, she was a delightful, small woman. And one time we were eating dinner with her and her family. And, and we said, how's the food? She goes, ah, the food in Auschwitz was better. You know, <laughs> like, I mean, like, just to be able to say that, you know, is... Yeah. is, is, is what, are the, what are the survivors I'm talking about survived not one but two bouts of typhus? which she would refer to as the typhuses. The typhuses. I survived the typhuses. The, ty the typhuses. <laughs> the typhuses. I can hear it. <laughs> can I, this is an incredibly naive question, but I want to ask it anyway, which is, why is this, these stories in fictional form are so much more emotionally powerful for me? So I've literally just written this chapter of my book, been immersed in stories about, real stories about the Holocaust, for the last two months, then, which moved me in all kinds of, but then I read your book and I'm a basket case. Why is it, why is the, why is the fictionalized version, which goes to the importance of writing, no, writing novels about this, right? If, if it is yeah. more powerful, then that's why we do more than write histories about it. So, but why yeah. is it more powerful? Um, because it begins with the real story and then you boil them and you get you get the you know the droppings of all the emotion without some of the details that might kind of mm -hmm. not work as well storytelling wise or whatever and you get those little the sediment at the bottom and that's and that's the raw stuff and you're able to inject that into your characters the little liar is historically accurate mm -hmm. all the way through except for the four characters yeah. Otherwise, everything that actually takes place is real. And when you can mix the real, but you can have your characters feel it the way you, you know you want to say they feel it, because a true story, somebody could go through something awful, but yet not register on them. And you want yeah. to shake them and go, why didn't it register on you? you know, and, and, but in a novel, you can create the emotions, and yet you get the best of both worlds from a creative point of view, because you get the real stuff, which is you couldn't make up. You could not make up the Holocaust. You know, I didn't have to. I, I didn't have to make up a scene where 9,000 Greek men are gathered on a Saturday morning by a bunch of Nazis and forced to do calisthenics for eight straight hours in a 100 degree heat. And if they fall down, dogs are sicked on them. And if they try to run, they get shot. I didn't have to make that up. It all happened on July something, 1942, in Liberty Square. All I had to do was put my characters there. Mm -hmm. So I think that's why, you know, you get the pathos that you're, you're asking because you can synthesize out of the real stories what works best as a storyteller. Yeah, yeah. Tell me a little bit about, I'm actually close to taking questions, but I have a couple more and then we'll do something. You're some. not going to ask me to play anything else, are you? <laughs> 
if you want to play some more Mitch, oh, no. That, yeah. no one is, would be unhappy. A afterwards, I'll provide the background music for refreshments. If, you <laughs> if there's you, an Oneg Shabbat, I'll be able to. Did, did, you, did you really uh, prepare for Tenderness, my favorite Paul Simon song? No, I'm not doing that. Oh, no. come on. <laughs> oh, yeah, we have some we, questions. We did meet over, uh, Malcolm and I met over Paul Simon. Well, not physically over him, but <laughs> although <laughs> that would be interesting, but no. Malcolm is a massive Paul Simon fan. I am the world's hugest Paul Simon fan. I've, I've met him once because Art Garfunkel and I were friends for a stretch of time and they came to Detroit and I met Paul Simon for like five seconds. He came by the table where we were eating and he was taking a power walk and he came by with his hands in his pockets and he said, oh, sports reporters, are the Yankees, how are the Yankees going to do? <laughs> and, uh, you so know, I felt like that was my moment with Paul Simon and he asked me about the Yankees, you know. <laughs> yeah, right. I didn't get to ask about any music or anything like that. And then Malcolm did this incredible, if you haven't heard it, it is the best um, sit-down uh, uh, audio book over how many chapters? 16, something yeah, like that? Yes. Yeah, uh, of Paul Simon and Malcolm and, and Ben. Was it Ben? Bruce. Oh, no, Bruce. Bruce yeah. uh, just talking to Paul Simon with the guitar about every song he wrote. What could be better than that? And he goes through them all and he plays them all. And, and I wanted, you know, you ever have that envy of like, oh, why didn't I wanted to do that? I wanted to do that. And, and Malcolm and I met, we did like an Instagram or something like that. And after talking it all through mm -hmm. and me telling him, finally Malcolm goes, you should have done this instead of me. And I said, <laughs> yeah. now you tell me. You, know. you should have. Yeah. My favorite? The, since we're talking about Paul Simon, I went to re-interview him over his last album. So we're in Texas. And he lets, and we're talking about the fact I have a small child. And he lets slip. He goes, oh, you know, I wrote, me and Edie, his wife, we wrote these children's songs. I was like, really? He goes, yeah, they're, yeah, they're great. I was like, has anyone ever heard them? No. Can I hear them? Yeah. Well, we got to listen in the car because it was only on CD. So we go out. It's like raining. It's a, we go out, we sit in his like SUV and he takes some battered at CD and puts it in the car, a CD player. And they are amazing. <laughs> They're so good. They're oh, wow. him and Edie in, and it's like, Paul, you know, if you put these out, they would sell. So yeah, the kids don't want me to publicize them. I'm uh, just like. <clears throat> now you're making me feel even worse. I know, yeah. <laughs> The, the kind of, in a these, car with Paul Simon. <laughs> I got the Yankees. How are the Yankees going to do? That's all I got. You know, He's, you got children's songs I in got children's songs. And every time, any time you bring something up with him, I sometimes email with him, you mention some. And he's always like, yeah, I knew him. And then story results. Yeah, right. It's fantastic. Anyway, we have, some, we have some. Oh, I had one other question I want to ask you. It's sort of a weird <sighs> question. Maybe I shouldn't ask it. It's sort of a downer question. That's um, fine. Ask well, no, I would, it's, an odd, it's an odd question, but I'll ask it anyway. You and I have something in common, which is that we are, and I say this with a great deal of affection towards both of us. <laughs> <laughs> we are middle-brow writers. We're not high-brow writers. We write very consciously for a large, the large audience in the middle. And that has got good things and bad things. It means that we reach more people than other writers, but it means that we get really nasty reviews and we will never win a prize. <laughs> so my question to you is, do you, does this bother you? Never. You, have you ever, have you won prizes? No. I never won a prize. <laughs> I never. I just I didn't even. look at it as never. But. <laughs> Mitch, Mitch, let me I break some to you. hopeful. You, we're never winning it. So you're not future. winning the booker for no, Little Liar. No, That's not, not happening. So my question is, does that, does, do you ever have a little moment where you think, you know, I kind of wish that the New York Review of Books gave me a 4,000 word review? And um, If I did, it was a long time ago. It isn't now. Yeah. Um, you know, I, my whole life has kind of been a little like that. Uh, you know, I went into writing, but I went to sports. Mm -hmm. and journalism and sports. It's like, that's ah, not real journalism. You know, well, it is to me. And it is to the people who read it. Yeah. Well, you went in a you know, newspaper, but went to Detroit. You know, I'm at the New York Times, and you're in Detroit. I said, well, you know what? The news is just as real in Detroit as it is in New York, you know? Uh, oh, well, you know, you, you, wrote, you wrote, you know, Tuesdays with Maury. Uh, Tuesdays with Maury got reviewed by the New York Times badly. 
because it's, what did the writer write? He said something like, um, there's, no, there's nothing here worthwhile, nothing to learn worthwhile. And I'm like, okay, well, so says you, and apparently all oh, the rest of the world felt that there was something in there. So I've kind of been living in that, you know, yeah. Midwest sports, all, you know, like you say, middle brow or whatever. Um, it doesn't bother me. It really yeah. doesn't bother me. It did, might have years ago, but it doesn't bother me. I'm happy. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm really blessed as a writer to have interaction with my readers that is very personal. And, uh, you know, I told you about some of them. When, when, when I talk to people who come up to me afterwards and they say, your book came at a certain time in my life that, that affected me greatly, you know, or I got back in touch with my brother after, after I read your book and we were estranged for years and, 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 you know, things like that. And you realize, do I need a 4,000 word review from a, yeah. you know, New York, or, or is, that, is that the best review you can get? Yeah. And I long ago made peace with that. Yeah. <clears throat> my, um, my version of that is I was once uh, running down Ocean Boulevard in um, Santa Monica and I see an incredibly handsome, very buff, young black man in a very, very nice Porsche with sunroof open. And he sees me and he shoots up through the sunroof, points at me and says, I love what you do, bro. <laughs> that never happened to Philip Roth. <laughs> never did. <laughs> he can have whatever he wants, but he didn't get that. Um, one, other, one last thing and then we are, well, we can go a little long. Um, Mitch, the most, I've left the most interesting and important thing about you to the last, and I did not learn this until I saw you speak at Hope College uh, last year, about this time, <clears throat> at the end of which I, like all other members of the audience, were in tears. And <laughs> you were speaking about this work. You've mentioned a couple of times that you've been doing in Haiti, and that you go to, you have gone to Haiti, what, once a month, every month for the last how many years? 14 years. Because you started an orphanage there. Tell us about that. Well, I, I went to Haiti. Uh, I'd, never really, I'd never been there. I didn't know much about it. I went a few weeks after the earthquake in 2010 to try to help a pastor um, who was from Detroit and said that he had an orphanage there and he thought it had been destroyed and all the kids had been killed. And I thought, well, this is just terrible. I mean, they're going to be under rubble. How are they going to find the bodies? So I traveled down there with them. Before there were any commercial flights in or anything, we were able to get a small plane in. We flew in. It turned out the orphanage had not been destroyed. A thing across the street had, but um, it was overrun. There were hundreds of people there waiting for food because they thought it's an orphanage. They'll bring food. And I was so taken with the kids and their attitude and their positivity that I started to go back um, to try to fix this place up because at the time, the toilets, for example, were just holes in the ground and in a, in a little field in the back. And when the kids would have to go to the bathroom, um, they would take rocks uh, if they went at night and they would take like a flashlight or a match and, and, and they would bang the rocks on other rocks to chase the rats away so that they wouldn't get bit on the rear end when they pulled their pants down. And then when they were done, they would wipe their rear end with the rock and put it in a hole because there was no such thing as toilet paper at a, you know, so, so it was pretty, pretty bad. And uh, we started to bring down um, people uh, to fix it up. Of course, in Detroit, a lot of people work with their hands, you know, a lot of roofers, contractors, plumbers. I know a lot of guys like that. They came down with me every month, month after month, and we started to build this place up. But I noticed that the kids weren't eating you know still and I said to the pastor after several months I said I don't get it you know like we're coming down here every month we're putting a lot of time effort fixing up the place but the kids aren't eating one cup of rice a day and he said well I'm 84 years old I don't have any money to run this place and I haven't had any money to run this place in years and I run charities in Detroit I've been doing it for a while and I blurted out very naively well I could probably run this place if you want me to. How hard could it be, you know? And uh, he basically said, you know, thank you, Jesus, hallelujah, here it is, you know. And, um, and he left, and we never saw him again. And, uh, and, and I, I inherited an orphanage, and, and so I made every mistake you can make 
uh, as a guy who doesn't, didn't have children of his own. Um, but, you know, love, love over, overrides a lot of mistakes. Mm -hmm. And um, I do love those kids. And uh, we've had probably close to 100 over the years. We have about 60 or 65 at any given time. Um, we don't ever adopt out. I wouldn't know how to do it. And uh, I, I would never have a kid come to us and then we have to give them away. That would break my heart. So once they come, they stay with us until they graduate school. We, we open the school. My sister helps run it. It's uh, four hours in English, four hours in French uh, every day. And it's very high quality school. And so far we've had um, all of our kids who've gone through there have come out and gotten college scholarships in the United States. 12 of them currently, and one of them is in his first year of medical school. And um, all of them come, will come back when they're done and work for two years at the orphanage in the field that they have learned, and, um, and then go out and hopefully make Haiti a better place. You know, we're not trying to run a one-way thing here. We're trying to change the narrative in Haiti. I always say to the kids, your job is to put this place out of business, you know, eventually. But we're a long way from that, and uh, it's a very, very dangerous, very, very... Um, sad place with the most amazing people and the most amazing children. Mm -hmm. And I am blessed to be in their company anytime I'm there. And, um, you know, I always say to them, I'm not your, your father, you know, but you are my kids. And, uh, and I look at them that way and, and I'm, I'm, you know, I hope to be going there for the rest of my life, you know, uh, I plan to. And those, those kids are, um, you know, we have a two year old now, as you know, who was brought to us when she weighed seven pounds at six months. She'd had nothing to eat but sugar water her whole life, if you can believe that. And uh, we didn't even know if she would live. We brought her to America to get her on a nutrition program, and um, she has yet to go back. And so <laughs> she's been here a year and a half now, and uh, thank God she, she lived, and she now was, I showed Malcolm a video she, last night, she was singing, We Are the World. She's two. And, uh, she's so, back. Yeah, she's, she's all the way back. And so when you see that, you just, you just, I mean, I'm not trying to save Haiti. Nobody can save Haiti. I just have one little corner of it there. And I just feel if other people come and do one little corner of it, maybe those children can get a break because they certainly deserve it. And um, I'm really proud to be there. So I take, yeah, about one week every month I'm down there. And, Which everyone's uh, crying, by the way. <laughs> no, they're not. <coughs> no, they're not. But uh, I've never met anyone. Honestly, I've never met anyone more open to everything. I mean, the whole, all the stories you've told tonight are all about something random happening, and you just accepting it. Yeah, I'm a big uh, man plans, God laughs kind of yeah. person, and I, I stopped planning things a while ago, and I just feel if something's put in front of you. I mean, I'm not some great altruistic person, I just feel if something's put in front of you, as this was, yeah. um, you can't walk away, you know. And uh, for whatever reason, I went down there and, um, you know, I was meant to be there and I'm not going to walk away. I live in Detroit. We got a lot of problems there. So I got involved in stuff there and I'm not going to walk away. And uh, it's not that hard. It's, it's, you know, doing good stuff isn't that hard. We make it out to be a lot harder than it is. It's, it's really good. Yeah. <laughs> um, hold on. We, I, I, thank you, by the way. Um, thank you. No, it's fun. Except that. <laughs> <laughs> now, come on. Now, now I think maybe you should just play a little song before we go. <laughs> um, let's ask at least one of these questions. Um, there's a sports question. About the Lions? And we, uh, and that's too sad. I don't want to bring that up. Uh, I will say, I was telling Malcolm that everybody in Detroit before, before two weeks ago or a week ago, it became this mantra because we have this terrible football team. You know, they have, hadn't won a playoff game in 31, 32 years. 32 years hadn't won a playoff game. And suddenly they got good and they were going to the playoffs. And everywhere you walked around, whenever you finished a sentence with somebody, they would say, go Lions. Like, so you'd be at the doctor and say, all right, so I, I get the pills at the, yeah, you pick them up at the pharmacy. Okay, thanks, doc. Go Lions. Go Lions. You know, everybody, that's what it was. And then we got into this championship. We made it to the championship, the NFC championship game last weekend. And there were two opportunities 
to kick field goals to like extend the lead because we were way ahead and he could have kicked field goals to extend the lead and our, our, our headstrong coach said, no, no, we're going for it and we failed both times and we ended up losing by three points. And so now, I was a guy, I was telling Malcolm at the airport today, I was going to come in here and I'm in line with a guy at the airport. He goes, uh, you Mitch Album? I said, yeah, he says, we should have kicked the field goal, right? <laughs> and said, that's, that's, everybody just says that now, should have kicked the field goal, should have kicked the field goal. <laughs> Take, they take your ticket, you're getting on, you know, thank you, thanks, should have kicked the field goal, right? Yeah. <laughs> so this is the first question. What do you think about Dan Campbell's decision to go for it on fourth See, down? there you go. <laughs> should have kicked the field goal. Should have kicked the field goal. <laughs> um, someone did ask a, a question about, um, and maybe this is a good place to end, about your connection to Detroit. Hmm. Um, Tell us, tell us, you, 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 you have a connect, you clearly have, you're a, someone with connections to places, um, to Haiti, to, it's very hard, it comes through of little, your, your love of Greece comes through in Little Liar. It really is very beautifully and firmly planted in Salonika, so am I pronouncing it right? Thessalonica, yeah. Thessalonica. Um, but tell us about Detroit, your adoptive Well, I went to Detroit uh, because I didn't get several other jobs that I was looking for when I was down in Florida. I was trying to get a job as a columnist. I applied for several of them and I didn't get them. And then out of the blue, I got called from Detroit. And uh, I went up there, I was very young. I was 25 years old. And uh, they offered me a job as a sports columnist. And I remember when I got there, they had written a little story about me that I was coming, but I hadn't written anything yet. And when I went to the office, they said, oh, there's a letter for you. I said, they're complaining already? You know, like I <laughs> haven't even written anything yet. I found this letter. I opened it up. It was a card, a lovely, like, kind of a greeting card, you know, kind of. And it was by an older couple. And they said, we want to welcome you to Detroit. We read the story about you coming. We know you won't stay very long because none of the good ones do. But we <laughs> hope that you enjoy your time while you're here. And... I was so struck by that. Like, they were already saying, well, he's not going to stay. Yeah. And as I stayed in Detroit, I realized, well, that tended to be true. You know, like people would come as a way station and then take off. And I think I said to myself, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to prove that those older people wrong. I'm going to show I'm going to stay. Now, they're you know, probably like, you can go anytime you want. <laughs> but, um, you've done your time. Yeah, you've done your time. <laughs> but I've been there uh, uh, 30, uh, 38 years now. Um, I intended to stay two years, but Detroit is not what most of you probably think. It is not, you know, um, I remember Sports Illustrated called me one time and asked me if I wanted to write a story about Detroit after, after we lost, our football team went 0-16. We mm-hmm. lost every game. And they said, do you want to write a story about Detroit, like how it's going through this you know, because 0 and 16, and plus it was a 2008, so the, the economy was in the dumper and, and the auto business was in the dumper. We had 25% unemployment. Do you want to write this story? I said, no, 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 I don't want to write that. And they said, oh, okay. And, um, and then I thought about it for a day, and I said, I talked to some of my friends, and I said, you know what they're going to do? They're going to send somebody from New York. They're going to have them go visit the old Packard plant, which is this burned out auto plant. They're going to have them talk about Devil's Night and how we burn cars on Devil's Night. They're going to send them to this one bar, the Lindell LC, and they're going to talk to a couple of -of out-of-work auto workers, and they're going to write the the decay of a Rust Belt City story. With the photo? It's always the same photograph. Yeah, always the same photo. With the house broken down in the background, the 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 burned out The burned out Packard plant. Exactly. I've seen, we all, it's it's poverty porn, you know? So I called them back, and I said, is that story, did you assign that? I said, no, we haven't. I said, okay, I'll do it. I said, but, I said, you don't have to pay me, but you can't touch a word. Are you willing to, to do that? I said, if you don't like it, you can kill it. But if you're going to use it, you're going to use it every word that I write. And they said, okay. And I wrote the shit out of that. <laughs> uh, I, and I, I just threw everything, my love for Detroit, into this thing. Mm-hmm. And I, I, had, I mean, I thought lines like, we are not the gum on the bottom of your shoe, you know, like <laughs> stuff like that. And I, and I talked about, you know, 
how we endure and how the people there, what they go through and how they're, how like in New York, you know, cause I was from the East Coast. When you, when you graduate high school or graduate college, you know, you say, oh, I just got a job in Phoenix and they have a party for you and everybody says goodbye and you go and then now you're living in Phoenix. In Detroit, you do that, you come out, you say, I got a job in Phoenix, they have a party for you, you go to Phoenix. Six months later, you see that person back. You say, what happened? I miss my family, I miss my friends. You know, that's what Michigan is, that's what Detroit is. We're, we're like stuck there, you know, and we don't have Broadway and we don't have LA, we don't have movie stars, but we, we have each other, you know, and, and there's a doggedness to Detroiters and a spirit and, a, and, a, and, a, and they're the most charitable people. People who have nothing are constantly giving to help charities and I run nine charities there, and we never have a problem raising money when we have, a, have an issue. And uh, I, I, I just wrote this whole piece from that point of view, you know, and, um, they, and they ran it, they and ran. they didn't touch it. They ran it without a single edit, which I think is a record for Sports Illustrated, because they love to edit. And they put it on the cover, and they said, you know, like, uh, and they didn't call it the death of a Rust Belt city. They, uh, I think it was like the heart of Detroit or something. Did it do like that. death of a Rust Belt city question mark? <laughs> <laughs> that would have been their way to yeah, get back yeah. at you. <laughs> yeah. So I love it there, and I'm proud to call it my home. And uh, I've been there far longer than I've been anywhere else. And I'm proud to represent the people. And if that puts me in the middle brow, never yeah. going to get taken seriously because I'm not the New York writer or the L.A. writer, I'm fine with that. You know, I'm, I'm really happy there. And I met my wife there, have a family there, have great friends there. We never wait online at a movie theater. We, <laughs> we never have a hard time parking. You can always, you know, we have big highways that are built because we have no public transportation, so our highways are huge, you know, because it's a motor city, you know, and we, everybody wants to have a car. And um, once every 32 years, our football team went to playoff game, so. <laughs> Can't argue with that. But we should have kicked the field goal. <laughs> um, Mitch, I think our time is, is coming to an end. Um, unless you would like to play one last song as a parting gift to all of us. Uh, come on, come on. I don't want to force you, but come on. What do you want me to play? Whatever you want. <clears throat> I'm trying to think if there's another, if there's another, um, if there's another meaningful song that I wrote that my wife sang for an Arnold Schwarzenegger movie. <laughs> but there aren't, you know. Um, let me see. What can I do? What can I do? Much of what you say is true. You say you care for me. But there's no tenderness beneath your honesty. That's your favorite Paul Simon it song, is. right? It is. Okay, there you go. Yeah. Thank you so much, um, and Mitch, I'm, I'm happy that you played that because there is an enormous amount of tenderness beneath your honesty. Oh, thank, yeah. you. Thank, thank you. Everybody. Thank you, folks. Thank you, Malcolm. That was a lot of fun. Though.